Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Andy Oakley, and welcome to my presentation, The New Zealand Economy, Anti-Abundance, Needless Suffering, and Death. Well, it's a pretty uh, macabre uh, title for a presentation uh, that's true. But also what's true is uh, the likely outcomes if a government uh, doesn't get the economy correct. Um, in fact, we've had 50 years of governments who are anti-abundance, okay, so they uh, uh, want fiscal responsibility. And the result of that is needless suffering and death. Um, this is through underfunding uh, in our health um, uh, areas, uh, roads, um, and all sorts of social um, areas where the government could be making a big difference. Uh, unfortunately, uh, things go bad. So today I want to um, introduce you to uh, components of the economy. What is money? What is an economy for? Uh, we're going to look at uh, a little quick history of New Zealand economy. Uh, when it starts to get, go wrong, what is going wrong? And what is right? Uh, what is required to put it right? So um, sit back uh, for the next uh, 40 or so minutes, and uh, hopefully we'll all learn something. Right, so the first thing we're going to look at is what is money? Well, in its simplest form, money is an IOU. And if we think about New Zealand uh, before there was a central government, uh, when we had uh, small separate societies or tribes, uh, it was easy. Uh, for people to know um, uh, who owed who. For instance, um, if you helped your brother in the garden, it was quite obvious that uh, he would uh, need to repay that um, favour. So really no uh, need to have uh, representations uh, of money. Small societies, people knew who owed uh, what. But obviously in 1840, as a result of the Treaty of Waitangi and the legislative processes after, um, all the separate uh, groups became one group. Now we had in this one country about uh, 72,000 people. Um, and so a better system was required and they simply adopted the British gold, silver and bronze coins. Um, and they became legal tender in 1858. And uh, it wasn't until uh, 1933 that distinctive New Zealand coins were introduced. And in 1967, we changed from the Imperial British Standard to the uh, decimal system that we have today. And the next question we need to ask ourselves is, what is an economy? Well, uh, what, what's it for? Well, some economists will tell you that uh, it's the system of producing, distributing and consuming goods and services. However, that's just a description of the things taking place as a result of having an economy. And I think that fundamentally the economy is a um, system to protect and provide for the people in a nation that has a central form of sovereignty or a government. And what's more, there must be a goal or a purpose for the economy. And I believe that that goal is full employment in a sustainable environment where people come first, not the economy. Too often, uh, I think governments get uh, tied up with trying to balance books rather than um, making sure people have um, uh, you know, successful lives. Possibly the biggest difference between a country that didn't have or did not have a central source of sovereignty, if, we, if we're looking back, and one that did, was the lack of infrastructure in the tribal environment. Now that's caused uh, mostly by the lack of political will to act collectively by separate groups or tribes. If we think about New Zealand again, uh, and we look back, well, there was a growing economy from that point in 1840 when we uh, became one nation, uh, and we look at that period um, from 1840 to 1900, the, there was the arrival of the banks. The first one uh, was the Union Bank of Australia, and then a number of others arrived. But there was no central authority to regulate or to administrate the currency, and so all banks operated independently and issued their own currency. Okay, so um, if we continue just to look back at uh, in New Zealand's history a little, and we look at the period uh, between 1840 and 1900, when um, obviously the 1840s after the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi and the legislative procedures that um, set New Zealand government up, um, and away we went. Um, and we can measure our performance in terms of uh, um, productivity or per capita GDP in New Zealand 
um, against other emerging nations such as the US and Australia. And if I just grab a um, highlighter laser pointer here. So we can um, measure our performance against the US and Australia um, in international dollars. And I don't think we need to be too concerned about what they are because um, we're more interested in the percentages uh, between the countries. And in 1840, we can look at um, the US number was 1588, um, Australia was 1374, uh, and New Zealand was 400. Uh, so we were 25% of the US and 29% of the Australians. Obviously, we had uh, just come out of at least um, four decades of intertribal warfare, and so there's not a lot of uh, productivity when um, measured against uh, the US and Australia. But if you ever wanted to know the power of um, uh, the Treaty of Waitangi, um, and uh, I'm talking about us coming together under a central form of sovereignty or a, or a government, um, that's Article 1 and Article 2, we uh, the introduce introduction of legislation or, or the law, property rights. And Article 3 was the protection offered by the government, which I think the economy is part of that, and equal rights. Now, if you ever wanted to know the power of, of those, look at the difference between the number in 1840 and, uh, and uh, 1900. In those 60 years, New Zealand had overtaken 105% uh, of the US and 107% of the Australia. This is a remarkable period in New Zealand's history that's completely ignored in our school system. Um, uh, we, we overtook um, many countries, if not most countries in the world with our uh, productivity, just in an amazing achievement that we could all be celebrating. But of course, um, in our system, our schools and universities want to teach um, a whole lot of negative stuff. In terms of productivity, uh, New Zealand was going from strength to strength. Um, but then, of course, we had the stock market crash uh, of the 1930s, were caused um, mainly by price instability. And it wasn't until um, 1934 that New Zealand established its own reserve bank, uh, with its primary purpose was to provide stability in the general level of prices. Before then, the monetary policy was decided in the UK and, um, and the New Zealand pound, and in the New Zealand pound, which was the currency up until uh, 1967. It was issued by independent private banks. Now, if we move forward to the next uh, period, with the, which is the 1950s, and during the 1950s, um, the New Zealand income per capita uh, was about 88% of the US. There was some um, tough import controls, which gave local manufacturers the ability to manufacture locally, competing well against much higher priced imports. And if I grab um, the laser pointer again, and we look at these, these figures. So um, as I said, the, the US um, had gone on uh, to become a superpower. So it would be pretty hard for, for New Zealand to keep up with them. And there's the numbers again. But look, at uh, nearly 90% uh, when we're measuring uh, per capita GDP as productivity um, per number of people, um, we're nearly 90% of the US. So that's, that's an absolutely uh, phenomenal performance, really, when you, when you consider uh, New Zealand. And uh, then when you look at Australia, we've gone on to be 114%. Um, so we're further ahead of Australia. This really was um, a marvellous performance by uh, New Zealand. Again, something that's not celebrated, um, and um, and we should. We, we have every right to be proud of such economic performance. Um, we'll look at uh, some of the um, we'll look at some of the uh, data that shows us how how good that was shortly. We move forward to, to the next um, period in New Zealand's economic history, 1975 to 1984. We had a national-led government under Rob Muldoon. Uh, we had um, an oil shock in uh, 1973. Um, and as a result of that um, oil shock, let me just grab the laser pointer again, we, um, which happened around here. Um, Unemployment went skyrocketing up to 12%. Um, and uh, 
Yes, the oil shock was caused um, mainly by Arab nations uh, targeting those who supported Israel. Now, to combat this um, high employment, uh, the national government came up with um, think big strategy. So this is um, mainly large projects, large infrastructure projects, dams and, and uh, Manapuri Dam and, and many others. And some of those um, projects are, are, are still uh, performing well in terms of uh, giving us some um, power and, um, and many other things. So uh, during that period um, of large government spending, the uh, Labour Party um, were really uh, giving it to the National Party saying they're running up uh, large debts. And so it's about this time in the 70s um, and 80s where I believe uh, neoclassical economists and politicians uh, begin to think incorrectly about how to run an economy. All right, if we move on to um, the next period, uh, 1984 to 1990, as I said, um, off the back of uh, Labour um, and probably some of the media getting on their uh, backs, including um, the uh, economists, um, it was uh, Labour were calling uh, for uh, fiscal uh, more or better fiscal responsibility. Um, and so we had uh, a period of uh, which we, we call today Roger Not, uh, Rogernomics. And there is Roger Douglas uh, with David Longy um, uh, when they won that election in 1984. Um, and they um, introduced a piece of legislation called the Public Finance Act, which was all about fiscal responsibility. Um, as I said, uh, during the uh, earlier national government uh, period, they were on at them all the time. So really, that they, they had to come up with something like this. Fiscal responsibility in terms of um, uh, what the Labour Party were talking about is low government spending, right? They uh, were trying to run surpluses. They had the idea that um, if governments didn't spend so much, they could save money somehow. Uh, also, during that period, uh, they um, enacted or, or changed the Treaty of Waitangi Act in 1985, and they allowed claims back to 1840. It is my personal opinion that these two pieces of legislation, the Public Finance Act and the Treaty of Waitangi Act, are the two most destructive pieces of legislation that New Zealand has ever had in its history as a country and um, we would be much better without both of them. Um, but this presentation is about the Public Finance Act, and we'll have a look uh, as we move forward um, what happens. Um, so if you look at this from 1984 here, as the Labour uh, government get in, and we look at unemployment, uh, this is the result of fiscal responsibility. Okay, So when the government don't spend much into the economy, uh, unemployment rises. People, basically people get poor. And uh, this uh, stayed this way for, um, well, unemployment figures over 6% uh, for a um, number of decades. Okay, so um, let's have a look at this Public Finance Act. This uh, act is uh, still in force today. And nobody's um, figured out uh, how bad uh, this act is for us. Um, so let's have a look at what, what they're doing. It's called, and we'll have a look um, principally at uh, 26, Clause 26G, Principles of Responsible Fiscal Management. Um, and uh, if we just read a little bit of that, the government must pursue its policy objectives in accordance with the following principles, the principles of responsible fiscal management. Um, Labour uh, governments tend to use this word principles quite a lot. Um, usually to their detriment, but never mind. Let's ha look at um, Clause A under 26G1. They state, reducing total debt to prudent levels so as to provide a buffer against factors that may impact adversely on the level of total debt in the future by ensuring that until those levels have been achieved, total operating expenses in each final year are less than total operating revenues revenues in the same financial year. So it's quite clear 
um, when we look at this piece of legislation that the uh, economic advice from the neoclassical uh, economists to politicians is that the government must run its budget as if it's a household, right? They um, are using the, the, they've forgotten actually that the, the New Zealand government are authorised to issue the sovereign New Zealand dollar into the economy, right? And they must do this to benefit the people. What this piece of legislation has done is forgotten all that um, and imagined that they are a currency user now instead of the currency issuer. They are imagining they are a currency um, user and they are putting constraints on themselves just as you would in a household. Obviously, you must, in a household, you've got to earn your money and spend less of it uh, than you earn, otherwise you go into debt. So this is what um, is happening during this period. Uh, I don't know whether any other government thought any different I don't think so. I think they all believed this uh, economic nonsense. But as I say, this is still the um, uh, Public Finance Act is still used today. So we're going to ask a couple of questions. I, th I think this is what uh, tends to happen with governments. Um, they don't, uh, I don't think they actually understand what they're doing and, and none of them really want to upset the apple cart. Nobody, um, even in the media, will question uh, what these pieces of legislation are really doing. So the questions we need to ask um, is, is the government uh, is the only authorised issuer of the sovereign New Zealand dollar? Why must it behave as though it's a household? Who came up with that idea? Are we questioning this? Why must it limit its spending to the amount of tax that it can take from people and businesses? It imagines that it doesn't actually have uh, currency issuing power and it imagines that it must take uh, money off people and uh, businesses before it can spend. Now this is uh, entirely incorrect as we'll see as we're going through the presentation but it's not questioned. In fact we're all taught to believe that this is the way governments operate and if you question it you're uh, known as a conspiracy theorist which I'm sure I'll be known as for even uh, raising these questions. So I think this is surprising and just because it's legislation, do we really uh, believe this? Who believe it are every single uh, political party um, that have either been in power or, or been in coalition? And if we just have a look at some of the political parties and we look at ACT, in their policy for the 2020 election is uh, balancing the books, return to surplus by 2024 and begin repaying the debt, cutting wasteful spending. They want to be in a surplus by 2024 and they also want to raise the age for pensions. So the, uh, the ACT party believe that uh, the country's better off when it takes money off people and governments spend less. So that's quite clear, um, the ACT party believe that. We move on to the Labour Party. This is October 2019, just before uh, COVID hit. The government was announcing that it had a surplus uh, of $7.5 billion. So uh, the Labour government believe that um, having money sitting in a bank, I'm not sure, quite sure how that works considering the government other issuer of, its own, uh, of our currency. Why it believes that having a whole piles of it sitting in the bank is a really good way to behave, particularly while we have uh, rising unemployment, um, underfunded health care and all sorts of underfunded social programs. And look at them, here they are announcing that they have $7.5 billion sitting in a bank somewhere. We move on to uh, uh, the Greens. They're coming up with outrageous statements in this uh, 2020 election campaign, such as tax is love, right? So they are another political party that believes taking money off private citizens and businesses is an act of love by a political party. This is uh, bizarre, bizarre behaviour. And as we get through this presentation, you'll just see how bizarre it is. Unfortunately, uh, the Labour Party um, collapsed the New Zealand economy in, in March um, and that $7.5 billion uh, surplus has turned into a $28 billion deficit. 
they forecast in 2021 that there'll be a $29 billion deficit. And look, they haven't, they haven't lost the faith. They haven't lost the faith. They want, they're forecasting a surplus in 2028. So they, they want to get back to the situation where they have money sitting in the bank, uh, taken off people and businesses. Fantastic. And the national are no different. Here they were in the previous uh, election campaign. They'll balance the book. John Key said they'll balance the book sooner, right? So he wants to lower government spending. He wants to t balance the government spending to the amount of money he can take off people and businesses. And of course, Bill English was the same. This rock got us through the global financial crisis and back into surplus. In my book, is um, absolutely bizarre behaviour, uh, but all the political parties um, believe it. Home ownership rates for households, 1936 to 2017. We're going to take have a look at some data of what happens when the government uh, start behaving in their minds fiscally responsible. responsible. So if you remember this period from 1900, uh, well, actually from 1840 uh, all the way to the 1950s, we, we were a um, very, very productive country, one of the most uh, productive company, countries per capita in the world. Um, and as a result of that, um, the government was spending uh, a lot of money um, and the measure of prosperity uh, of um, citizens was improving all the time. It kept improving all the way up um, until 1956, we get to about 70% home ownership rates in New Zealand, which is a fantastic achievement. Um, again, something that we should be celebrating. Our economy uh, was performing just magnificently. And, uh, and, and when we look at the data, we find that in the 1950s, this 70% home ownership rate was achieved uh, mostly by a single income. Okay, so the average man on the average wage raising a, a family with um, two parents and three or four children could afford to buy a house on that single income. And then we look at the unemployment figures at that period, it was 1%. So um, this was a, just a fantastic result. You know, mum or dad or one of the parents could stay home and um, raise the, the children. There's periods of relatively low crime, social stability, um, and that went on uh, for many decades. And I remember this, I was born into this, this period. So through the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, on it went. Um, and in the mid 80s, it, it even took, went a bit higher. Um, and I believe that was uh, mainly because a uh, woman more women entered the workplace, so um, now the homeownership rates were slightly rising. But um, then we look, when we look a bit deeper into that period, we see that something's actually starting to go wrong. So now it's taking a double income to, um, to buy the house. And we look at unemployment during that period, and it was rising steeply. It was at about 8% unemployment. And, and just at that time, at that wonderful time when home homeownership rates were raising or heading towards 80%, uh, the government uh, decided um, that it needed to take money off people and businesses and, uh, so, and put money in their bank accounts and they introduced a goods and services tax, okay, um, at which mainly hits um, private citizens, businesses can claim back GST. So this is an attack on private citizens. I think it was 10%. Uh, when it first came in, when we're up at 15% um, now. And then, uh, just a few years later, the government uh, introduced the uh, Public Finance Act, which we just discussed before. And since that time, everything in terms of home ownership rates has been heading south, plummeting downwards uh, faster than it came up. And uh, in 2016, we were back to uh, 1940s rates. Um, and I think, uh, we, well, it's not that I think the data shows that we're uh, well below that now. Now we can add a, a, another period on uh, to our per capita GDP in, in New Zealand, and we can look at the years 2000 to 2018. And so those plummeting household uh, figures um, are matched by plummeting productivity figures. 
And so this wonderful achievement that we had done by 19, uh, 1900 dropped to 50%, 57% of our performance against the US and steadily going down against Australia. Basically, we're watching the private wealth and productivity dropping since the late 1980s. People are becoming less prosperous. That's what's going on here as a result of um, terrible uh, economic decisions by our politicians and economists. Uh, more uh, data, house prices relative to income and rents. And basically, uh, this graph shows that from the uh, late 1980s, house prices and rents have become out of control. And I think this slide goes up to about 2012, but if it, if it went out to 2020, um, we know that the, the houses, uh, houses and rents have largely become unaffordable for the, aver the person on the average wage. More uh, quite clear data there. Some more figures to look at. Uh, this time we're looking at the New Zealand gross core government debt. Basically, what we're looking at on this slide is government spending, and they're using the term government debt uh, to represent that. As we uh, discussed earlier in 1840, there wasn't a lot of government spending going on, but as soon as um, the government was formed and money was coming into the economy, productivity rose. And the more debt that the government um, had, uh, the more productive New Zealand uh, was. And we get to about 1880, and um, the New Zealand uh, government debt goes past 100% of GDP. And it stays that way through the uh, 1800s, 1900s, 1920s, 30s, 40s, uh, till about the 1950s. Is, um, the government spending is way above 100% of GDP. Um, and if we look at these periods of high government spending, um, here we see the uh, the depression of the 1930s um, and the government when the government spent um, masses of amounts of money into the economy um, uh, to, to get it back to stability again and, and they achieved that um, after the war was a, a wonderful period so these long uh, periods of high government spending resulted in uh, a, a periods of high public wealth so I want you to remember that as we move forward, the, the more the government spend, uh, the better off the people of New Zealand are. So hopefully you are um, beginning to understand the relationship between high periods of government spending and high, high levels of public prosperity. If we weren't worried about that high government spending, Essentially, we could um, all be prosperous and not have to worry about this debt. We've had very high levels of uh, government debt before, and other countries do. America d does, Japan does, and all these countries are fiat cur currency countries just as we are. That fiat currency means that they issue, the government issue the sovereign uh, dollar into the particular, whatever the country is. So, there appears to be something not right about um, being in deficit. The countries that do it um, a lot more than us don't seem to be getting high inflation. There doesn't seem to be any problems with doing it. So I think we need to start looking at where this, this myth about deficits is coming from. Um, and, and it comes from the thinking, I believe, and, and you'll see um, a large number of economists around the world also believe that it comes from the incorrect thinking or um, economic um, uh, ideology that um, the government must behave like a household. But as we know, the government are not like a household, right? They can issue their own currency. No household can issue its own currency. And if you were lived in a household that could uh, l um, issue its own currency, you wouldn't starve your children, right? <laughs> which is what they're doing. They're, they're trying to be fiscally responsible by not spending money, essentially uh, removing the re prosperity from businesses and people. They've got themselves into the thinking that taxes fund government spending. That is not correct. That is not correct. Legis current legislation 
if we just forgot about this Public Finance Act, the government are authorised, legally authorised to uh, issue currency into the economy and they can do it at will. They will never run out of uh, sovereign New Zealand dollars because they are the issuer of it. So that means taxes do not funding government spending and we'll have a look how that works in the next few slides. And here are just a, a small selection of the progressive economists all over the world that um, understand uh, that, that many governments, in fact most of them, fiat, uh, fiat currency governments, uh, are thinking incorrectly about how to run their uh, economies. So we have on the left L. Randall Ray, um, uh, professor of economics. Uh, he's written many books. There's one of them, The Modern Money uh, Theory. Um, there's the next one along is Stephanie, uh, Professor Stephanie Kelton. Um, she's, she wrote the, the book, The Deficit Myth, Myth um, in the last uh, American uh, presidential elections. She was the economic um, advisor to Bernie Sanders. Uh, don't worry too much about um, the modern monetary theory being um, left or right. It's not. It's, it's just a lens of looking at the, the economy, the current economy, the current economy that we uh, are using now. Next along is Warren Mosler, uh, which um, uh, another um, a friend of mine, uh, Warren Press and myself, are in email contact with Warren, who's uh, giving us a lot of advice about the banking setup and the, how to run an economy. Uh, and on the uh, right there is uh, Professor Bill Mitchell, who, um, and that photograph there is him standing in the Victoria University of, of New Zealand in 2017, where he gathered a lot of um, economic experts in, in New Zealand, and he um, uh, gave them a presentation similar to the what I'm um, about to tell you here, explaining that they have got the economy uh, wrong. I just found out recently that in that audience was Jim Bolger because in this um, current situation, the, the, the COVID situation that we find ourselves in, the government issuing lots of money, I heard him on a radio um, uh, station talking about being at that conference and, and um, actually uh, wondering whether we should look at this money uh, monetary theory. And uh, it's one thing I, I do agree with them on. I, I don't agree with them on many things, but I, I do agree with them on that. Okay, some more data here that we can look at um, uh, that can uh, clarify uh, some of the thinking that, um, or some of the points that I've been making. If we look here at the US government budget balance versus the private sector, and I'm using the US one uh, because it's easier to get um, information, um, well it is for me anyway, but they are a fiat currency and they run their economy in exactly the same way as we do, there's, there's really no difference. And if we look here at uh, the percentage of GDP on, on the side there and the government's uh, budget balance in red, this means they're in, uh, they're in red, they're, not, they're uh, spending more than they take in, um, in uh, tax, taxes basically, they're in um, issuing government bonds and going into debt. So their red ink you can see is the, um, the private sector, um, which is people and businesses, is their black. So every time you hear in the, uh, in the economic uh, papers in America that um, the government are in red or they're further in red, as you can see as time goes on, the, the debt gets bigger. Well, the opposite is also true, that the people and businesses are getting uh, uh, more prosperous. So uh, rather than uh, the economic papers writing uh, things like the government are deeper in debt, uh, they would be just as true or just as accurate to say that um, the people and businesses are, are in great periods of prosperity. And you can see the correlation here. And uh, things are, are pretty good for the American people for uh, quite some time until we get to this period uh, around the late 80s when uh, neoclassical uh, economists around the world started to advise politicians that uh, government spending uh, is, is a problem, that debt is, is the problem. Debt is causing inflation and debt is doing this and debt is, debt is causing high interest rates and all sorts of things. Um, 
and so they begin to uh, spend less. And as they spend less, the people and businesses become less prosperous. So they're heading for a surplus, right? They get it in their minds that they need to run a surplus. And in 2000, the Clinton government achieved surplus. So, uh, and look what happened to people and businesses. They uh, plummeted into recession. So anybody who believes that a government should uh, run surpluses needs to look at this data. It's the same for every single country that do it. It's the same for New Zealand. You will be aware that our, we are less prosperous today than we were when the government spent a whole lot more. So we can see here that the, the, the government thought, shit, something's going wrong here, and they started to spend uh, um, more into the economy. And as soon as they did, the people started to come back towards um, level pegging again. Um, and then they forgot. <laughs> and uh, the, the people uh, plummeted again. And then somebody had some sense and spent a lot of money into the economy and the people got into uh, a pretty good space again. But you can see that uh, through economic pressures and mismanagement, they're heading downwards again. So um, it's pretty clear to see what's going on there. Um, with deficits, deficits, governments running deficits are extremely good for people and businesses. All right, so I'm going to try and explain um, uh, a, a little bit of, about why productivity matters over the long run, and its uh, productivity is largely as a result of the government issuing currency into the economy. So this uh, line, this growth rate, is directly linked to how much money the government uh, issue into the economy. In New Zealand, our line would be sort of way down here somewhere because they're aiming for a really low growth rate of about 3%. They hardly ever achieve it, by the way, uh, and that's because they don't uh, issue enough money into the economy. The, the, the people and businesses are getting less prosperous, the tax takes are lower, and it all um, heads south. So um, we'll see in the next slide um, how how the government and banks inter interact with each other. Here we see the relationship between uh, banks issuing credit and um, productivity. So here's our productivity line uh, driven by the government issuing currency. That'll be higher or lower depending on um, how much they're issuing. So we he see here that uh, private people and businesses credit, credit largely from banks is, is uh, well, Credit is bringing future uh, government currency into the present. That's basically what's happening when um, banks issue cre credit. They're bringing future money into the, into the present. So people um, borrow money off banks, um, and we get to a situation where um, there's more money in the system than uh, goods that we produce. And this can only last so long because, as I say, productivity is driven by government spending. And we get to a point uh, where it becomes unsustainable, and um, uh, we have to. Uh, there is uh, recessions and depressions uh, occur uh, that bring us down to a situation where uh, we ha have less than we produce, and then there is recovery until we get to the point where we are balanced again um, with the economy um, or people and businesses uh, have the right amount of money uh, relative to government spending. If we have a uh, closer look at these um, credit bubbles and, and how they work, um, largely caused by um, governments not issuing enough um, into the currency. Um, so we have this long uh, credit bubble here, which we looked at before. Uh, these have a cycle of about um, 75 to 100 years, and uh, if we think about where the 1930s depression was, and we add 90 years on to that cycle, we get to 2020, and here we are in recession again. Um, so uh, also uh, is the shorter cycles, five to eight year cycles, uh, which we get, um, you know, uh, credit bubbles and recessions over a shorter period and this longer period. But um, it all equals zero and it all is dependent on the, um, 
or bank credit always equals zero. So there we go. It, it, it can fluctuate all over the place depending on various factors, but it always gets back to zero. Now, if we look at, uh, again, I'm looking at American data. It's, as I say, it's easier for me to, to get this data. And we look at previous economic cycles before uh, 1930s depression. So there was 1837, 1847, 1857, 1863, 1873. Um, so these are these sh shorter cycles, which we were looking at previously. Um, we can, I just got some information from the uh, Reserve Bank of New Zealand, the bulletin that they re released in 2008. And this shows you um, how out of touch our economists and our, our government really is. They say history doesn't repeat itself and they say shocks differ, policy frameworks differ and so the markets in which firms and, and, and markets and financial institutes operate but there's some useful perspectives. So they're not learning from uh, the the um, data that's um, that's available for them. Uh, rather than learning from the data and the actualities they're operating on the, the information and the PhDs so, and what's taught in uh, economics um, classrooms, uh, rather than um, uh, being progressive and thinking about uh, what really happens. Now some uh, more analysis. Uh, the government debt as a percentage of GDP. We're looking at this line here. And if, if you remember um, around the, the 1930s depressions, the government was spending a lot of money um, and these gray areas here, uh, depressions and, and recessions, these are the smaller ones here. So there's a long periods of government uh, spending way or uh, uh, percentage of GDP way above 100% um, and it gets to the 1980s and it heads uh, all the way south. So we get to a point where uh, governments uh, have some unwritten rule whether they um, try to keep uh, government debt under 20% uh, of GDP. I don't know where that rule came from. Um, it's cruel. It's uh, robbing us of our prosperity. We can look at, uh, put some arrows on here and look at a period of great government spending um, results in this period of great private wealth. This is this period we looked at sort of after the war all the way up into the 80s before things uh, really started to to head south for us. Now we've had a long period of low government spending. We're down here, and uh, the result of uh, low government, long periods of low government spending is that we our prosperity is uh, tanking. Okay, I left this slide in, um, how, or the next slide anyway, uh, from another presentation. How was I able to predict an economic collapse in in February 2020? Well, if we look at this uh, long cycle credit um, bubble here and the shorter cycles here, um, and we look at, start here at number one. Well, we were in, in February uh, this year of 2020, we were in this uh, situation here. Um, we had uh, falling uh, overnight cash rates, 1%. Um, you know, we were down to 1%. They were trying to stimulate economic activity, um, but it really wasn't working for them. Um, the main reason uh, would have been that uh, household and private debt um, were 94%, uh, 94.4% uh, of GDP. Um, so this is, we're in this massive high credit uh, bubble. That's what tells you high levels of public debt means we're at this very, uh, the edge of this precipice here. I think we were only four countries in the world had more household debt than New Zealand. We had rising unemployment uh, rate. Well, they were showing 4%, but the, um, really they're hiding uh, the, um, the unemployment uh, or the lack of employment opportunities for people uh, by using that figure is really the underutilization rate that we should be looking at. That is the rate at which people would work more if they if they could, and that is uh, a massive figure. Here, here it was 11 uh, percent. It's it's gone up to uh, 12, 13, 14 percent now because of the the COVID situation. 
um, we saw the government trying to balance the books. So when all this is going on, they're trying to spend less. You saw in October 2013, the government boasting that they had uh, a 7.5 million uh, um, surplus. Then uh, in January 2020, we saw COVID-19 reported in China. Um, and it was in February 2020, COVID-19 was reported in New Zealand. And uh, on February the 10th, uh, once I was looking at these things, I released a YouTube video called The Great New Zealand Economic Collapse. And uh, at about 17 minutes in, I predicted that um, all these um, things that were, were needed to be in place before we had a, a, a massive crash in our economy were there and, uh, and it was coming at some point. Um, and then in March uh, 25th, 2020, uh, Jacinda Ardern announced New Zealand to go into level four lockdown for one month and then extended that to five weeks and we've gone in and out of um, lockdown since then uh, and New Zealand has experienced a economic collapse. So there you go, all the um, signs were there in February um, and, and I picked it. So here's some information, uh, this is that underutilisation rate from Stats New Zealand and we're looking uh, at the March 2020 quarter looking back. So these figures were before we went into lockdown um, uh, heading towards 11% um, and that equates to 299,000 New Zealanders would work more hours if they could get it. Right? So, uh, the, this figure now is up around 12 to 14 and, and it's going to go higher as soon as these government subsidies. Look at the amount of people who can't work as much as they want to. This is an incredibly uh, uh, bad uh, situation for New Zealanders and um, largely it's uh, they're having the wool pulled over their eyes because I, I recently uh, we're, we're in um, September 2020 now, we're being told that the unemployment rate has fallen to 4%, but they're not telling us the underutilisation rate. So here we're going to look at the pre-COVID truths. Um, I put these figures together looking back um, before COVID was with us. So um, the average uh, take-home wage, take wage for uh, New Zealanders uh, was $780. The median rent in Wellington is $540. Of course, where most of the population are in Auckland. Uh, these figures are, are much higher. The average take-home wage, though, is that's a, a nationwide figure. So the median rent in Wellington was $540. How is it possible for a man or a woman, a single man or woman, trying to raise a family on an average wage to even pay the rent? It's impossible. You need uh, government subsidies, government welfare must be paid to you um, so that you can afford to pay your rent. Imagine what that does to you, um, that you, your skills are not enough to uh, earn enough wages to pay the average or median rent in Wellington. The median house price in Wellington was 629000 That's an impossible task for a person on 780 uh, dollars a week to buy a, the median house. And again, in Auckland, that's a, a lot higher. So out of control private debt, we have 94% of GDP, tanking business confidence, rising unemployment and underutilisation. So what we're looking at here is since the 1980s, all previous, previous government policies have resulted in long-term prosperity, uh, lowering prosperity and productivity for New Zealanders. If you ever want to know why we are a low wage, low productivity country, this presentation is explaining to you exactly why. And of course, these are the people from both Labour and National that have taken us uh, from the social stability of a single income home ownership model in the 1950s and 60s to a double income social welfare topped up housing unaffordable model. They are a disgrace to economics and are collectively responsible for the deaths of thousands of people in underfunded healthcare systems and also much of the social breakdown as they're young have little hope of being prosperous in their entire lives. These people are dangerous. Now you might be thinking that this slide is an attempt at uh, humour from me. Well, 
Um, actually, it's the opposite. And this slide is to demonstrate um, how uh, people, or even the um, high, highly thought of medical people in um, Britain in the mid 1700s, believed that um, uh, if a person dr dr drowned or had other uh, ailments, that blowing smoke up their bottoms with a tube was the cure. Now, nobody questioned this, so all the uh, leading medical uh, professionals of the time thought this was the way to cure drowning and, and a few other ailments. Nobody was um, uh, game enough to, to stand up against this, and so everybody just followed it. So what I'm demonstrating here is that economists, uh, including the finance ministers, uh, are, are believing a, um, a method of monetary uh, policy, which which is uh, bizarre, quite frankly, and, um, um, and and if you don't think it's possible that people can believe bizarre things, well, you just need to look at this slide. This slide here is to um, is an illustration that I put together to um, to explain the current monetary system. I call it a uh, limited money supply system because. Um, their, the government are running a, a, a limited monetary system. They uh, will not spend into the economy any more than they can tax out and borrow in the form of bonds. So they have purposefully, pur purposefully limited themselves. They call it fiscal responsibility, if you remember. This is a balance the books model. Okay, so how this uh, how this uh, monetary system works is it starts every year with the finance minister um, his duty to run a budget. Okay, so how he runs a budget is not uh, by looking at the country and what it needs. No, this he's not bothered about people. What he's bothered about is what treasure treasury will forecast that they will receive in tax revenue from. Um, from the economy. This cylinder here is representing the economy with circulating currency, industry, commerce, and public and private saving. So in 2017, that figure was something like about $80 billion. The uh, finance minister then thinks this is not nearly enough to, um, to spend into the economy. He, he then thinks about what he can do with that $80 billion, and it's not enough to fund the hospitals, the social welfare system, and do all the things that need to be done. So he turns to his next uh, form of revenue. And uh, in this case, it is the issuing of um, New Zealand government securities or bonds. These are, um, the government um, creates a, a financial asset. Um, in, in this case, we'll say uh, $20 billion. Um, let's say that $20 billion is the maximum they can uh, borrow because any more is more than 20% of GDP, so they've limited themselves, if you recall. So they create this asset as a bond note, and it has a value of $20 billion, and it has um, the purchaser will, will get interest on this. Basically, what happens, and for the uh, ease of um, uh, simplicity, if you like, I've decided that one entity will buy these bonds. It is usually overseas ent entities, up to 80% of bonds is bought by overseas entities, and they're obviously large and wealthy um, corporations or countries. And in this case, I've decided that China purchases that uh, $20 billion government um, bond. What happens is they um, give the government the equivalent of um, $20 billion in cash. So there is a swap, a $20 billion valued bond um, goes to the Chinese and the $20 billion cash is deposited into the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. Um, and the numbers uh, go up and they now have $100 billion to spend into the economy. Um, as I said, it's, it's not nearly enough. Um, but it, it does generate some currency industry co commerce. It's just, you know, the, the economy's got lots of idle workforce, unused uh, resources, and potential commerce there. <coughs> now, if you remember, this is a, the Chinese are getting interest off the bonds for the period that it's in the, in the bank uh, or the term of the, the bond issuance, whether it's five years or 10 years. That, that uh, tax 
sorry, that interest is drained out on and paid to the Chinese. So you can see now they say that they have a $20 billion deficit, deficit right? So everybody's panicking because we're $20 billion um, in the red um, and uh, worried about how we're going to pay this back. So you can see that there's almost nothing in this system that can, um, that can improve things. So the only way to improve things will be to take more tax off the uh, people and businesses. But if they did that, you know, there'd be some sort of economic collapse or borrow more money, but they've limited themselves to 20% of GDP. And when they borrow more, there's more interest goes out in, ta in tax. So there's almost nothing in the system that allows them to fill the economy up. It's a flawed system. And it's this system that's resulting in the loss of prosperity for people and businesses in New Zealand. And so we see this spreadsheet that the government are operating has become more important than the people. So they're more interested in balancing the books than actually uh, providing for the people. That they're not doing the job that they are supposed to do as a government. So tax revenue and borrowing has become the driver of our economy. Yet the government are the only authorised issuer of the sovereign New Zealand dollar. So how can this be? Let's have a look then at how an economy is created and ask some questions about what, what is tax for? Um, if it's not for government spending. Well, let's condense the, um, the New Zealand economy into a short period of time and then we can see what actually happens. Imagine that the 5 million people of New Zealand <coughs> arrived today and there was no infrastructure, but they could communicate collectively. Um, so the first thing to realise is that to have infrastructure, to provide for the people, you need a government. So let's imagine they elect a government. And then they would decide what they want, whether it's schools, hospitals, roads, care for the elderly, um, whatever it may be. They would um, divide into the school sets and the government would then impose a tax liability, right? So they'd create a currency, the New Zealand dollar, and they would impose a tax uh, liability um, for all the productive labour that the people are about to, to carry out. So they'd uh, create some uh, banks, um, the people would uh, all have a bank account, the people would go to work, the government would issue them the um, New Zealand sovereign dollar into their bank accounts for the work that they were doing and retain 10%, let's say, for tax. So this is, creates the fiduciary re relationship. The government creates a tax liability on the people and they must work to get it. It's not the other way around. The money isn't sitting with people in the government um, take it off them. The government must first issue the currency, and where did it come from? They simply made it up. The word fiat in fiat currency means because I said so. This is where money comes from, the government. And as I said, the government issue currencies via a keystroke on a computer. They aren't actually handing out uh, coins or dollar notes. They do it via a keystroke on the computer. That's how they've done it for a very long time. And they must issue it, uh, the, the amount of money to match the capacity in the economy. So that's the role of the government. Now, if, we, if I grab the um, laser pointer here, and we imagine that the government are issuing their um, dollars through this representation, which is a tap. And on the slide, you can see that this is a representation of what's currently happening now. The government are not issuing enough and haven't been for about 50 years uh, money into the economy. So what happens is um, you never get a lot of activity in, in this, the bowl, which is uh, representing the economy. It's not very much activity uh, going on there. And the drain is um, the representation of tax. So this is how the monetary system works. The government enter uh, money into the economy and the tax is drained out. Now, tax is not connected to the tax. Taxes to uh, balance the economy. Tax binds the state, as I mentioned in the previous slide, and it also allows them to control the economy. So they can turn the tax tap, uh, tap up and down, just like they can turn the issuing of currency up and down. So that's how um, the uh, uh, quite an easy way to 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 think about how our current uh, monetary system operates. And so we're looking at the, the opposite situation with this slide where the uh, government is uh, issuing 
uh, a lot of uh, currency into the economy um, and they are not taxing very much out of it. Um, and so what's happened is they've gone past the capacity of the economy. So in this situation, um, some economists say that uh, you can get inflation. But uh, in practice, we don't see that. We don't see countries that uh, issue a lot of uh, currency into the economy. This is productive economies, such as uh, the US and Japan. They don't get into inflation problems. In fact, they get into deflation problems. Um, again, I'll just point out that to, to fix the situation, um, you would either uh, take more tax off people and businesses or issue less currency into the economy or a bit of both to balance it up. The goal would be to have uh, running with the uh, economy near the top um, of the, the bowl in the situation. Okay, so now we're looking at a capacity driven money sub, uh, system. This is not a limited money supply system. This is the way to view the economy correctly. Right, so we must remember that tax revenue does not fund uh, government spending. So how this system works is it's exactly the same um, as we did previously, except this time when the uh, finance minister runs a budget, he can look at what the country needs. Do we need uh, more roads or hospitals or schools or what does the country need? What is the capacity constraints of the economy? Some things he can do easily. Like, uh, for instance, uh, increasing the pension. There's no capacity constraints on uh, increasing the, the pension. So you can pay as, as much pension as, as they decide they need to. Um, but it could be that um, they need to, a whole, whole new roading network and, and there's just not enough capacity there to, to do it. So these are the things that the finance minister would be thinking about when he um, does a budget. And in this case, you can see the budget is much higher. It's a double, in fact. Um, because he's decided that they need a whole lot of things. So he doesn't need to get that uh, money from taxes. It's issued through uh, Treasury and the Reserve Bank into the economy. Um, and you can see now that there is more currency circulating, more industry, more commerce, higher wages, less private debt, uh, debt and much less tax. So the, we're filling up the capacity of the um, of the economy. So there's less idle workforce, less unused resources, and a better use of our capacity. Uh, we must tax, as I say, this is the thing that binds the state. The people must um, pay tax. They, they need to have this fiduciary relationship with the uh, government. So you can see that, that it's much lower levels. Right? And if we were to look at or were concerned at the difference between the amount that they're taking out and the amount that they're spending in, it's $170 billion. But you can see that $170 billion, which is the deficit, is actually in the economy. This is how it always has worked. It's not a debt. Um, we don't have any borrowing going on here. There's no requirement for borrowing. I personally don't believe that we need to have a bond market. Um, there's no necessity for it, it's just a carryover from um, uh, operating in the gold standard days. Now here's the best part. What are the economic pol policies possible under the capacity driven money supply system? Well, we can design, build and maintain our infrastructure. So hospitals, schools, roads and public amenities. We will never have to let these things uh, get run down or not have enough of them. So we would do this to, um, to, to the capacity constraints that allow us. We simply call for tenders and issue the money to New Zealand companies. Um, this is the way to run the tender market. Um, not the lowest price either. We don't, uh, there's no need for governments to drive the price down in, in tenders. What they should be looking at is selecting companies that have the capabilities to deliver the projects, the health and safety uh, records, um, and that they're not paying their, um, their, their employees the lowest prices, not how you should um, uh, run the tender market. We can abolish GST. There's no requirement for the government to um, uh, have tax to, to, to spend. So this is leaving the money in people's pockets to generate spending because it's sales that drives the economy. Leave the, the money in the people's pockets. We would reduce uh, private PAYE and corporate tax rates. 
So again, leaving the money in the people's pockets and allowing New Zealand companies to compete with the overseas companies. This is allows them to, to grow their companies, to employ more people and pay, pay more money as well. We'd introduce a government guaranteed job, so at least 35k tax free. So that there's no un involuntary unemployment in New Zealand. This has been a terrible scourge. Unemployment is caused by governments. They're, they are the only reason there is unemployment. They don't issue enough money into the economy. So that, that the um, downsides of unemployment obviously is all the social problems that we have from it. So this is a way out of the, a lot of those social problems. No unemployment. Pensions will be 35 uh, K tax free. The go remember, the government can never default on payments in the New Zealand dollars. It, issue it is the authorised issuer of the currency. No more requirement to scare pensioners and to have people saving their whole lives for their retirement, not contributing to the economy. You can see that was a terrible uh, policy they had. Couples would receive uh, 35k tax free for uh, raising the children. So if the mother or the father is at home looking after the children, they would be receiving a wage. And the minimum their partner would be getting, and the minimum would be 35k tax free in a government job. So there's 70,000 tax free. Now people can afford to have children. This has been one of the problems why we needed to uh, bring in uh, lots of immigration. New Zealand families could not afford to have. Um, uh, enough uh, children to, to for our economy. So um, consequently we needed to bring that, those skills from overseas. And I believe central government's funding for local governments. So now we can have rates caps and, and minimum requirements in, in regions for um, public amenities. So um, this is exciting stuff. Um, and, and I think this is the, the, the most important thing that uh, we can do for um, our children and their, and their children in the future. Get the economy uh, correct. And there we have it. Um, we've come to the end. Well, thank you very much for your time today. And, and don't forget these ideas are not um, mine or, or, uh, or people around me. They are. Um, they come from uh, progressive economists all around the world, um, trying to get politicians and economists to, to think outside the square and to uh, focus the, the monetary systems on people rather than spreadsheets. Um, my hope is that um, we, political parties uh, will start to see this, that economists will see the writing on the wall. And uh, I encourage you to spread this, um, this type of monetary system information as far as you can. Um, and talk to your um, local politicians and, and get them to try and get them to see sense. So thank you very much for your time. I've been Andy Oakley.